What is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the new X-Men comic, Way of X, by Cy Spurrier and Bob Quinn. And in this video, we are going to witness the struggle that Nightcrawler is having with living on Krakoa in this new era of mutantdom, and why it is shaken and in other ways broken the faith that he is so well known for having, and also why he's struggling with creating a new mutant religion. We're also going to learn that on Krakoa, there's a new boogeyman that mutants are beginning to fear more than Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch. And for good reason, because this is a character we haven't seen since before House of X. And they have a bone to pick with Krakoa about why they do not resurrect mutants who can see the future. We're going to talk about all that and more right now, but first, let's hit that intro. Word the wise, grass only greener when it's fertilized. Gave them truth in these songs, they prefer the lies. Destiny beautiful, a drift in her purple lies. You can't see me, you see me. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie and make it look easy. This issue really hammers down on the points of religion and Krakoa and why these two things probably don't mix very well and why Nightcrawler is struggling so much with this. We remember if we go back to when the Crucible was introduced so many issues ago back in X-Men number seven, we remember that Nightcrawler did talk about the idea of wanting to create a mutant religion and why this was important to him and why it should be important to Krakoa. But by the time we get to Cy Spurrier's way of X, things have changed a little bit. He doesn't really know where to start with it and more importantly he's becoming concerned with the state of mutantdom and that in and of itself has been affecting how he's pursuing the idea of a mutant religion. One of the main things that tends to come up a lot is the fact that death has become cheap and this is made even more apparent to Kurt when he realizes that while on a mission going to take on an Orcus facility in Italy where Orcus is essentially creating some kind of a mutant hate museum that also doubles as some kind of a mutant hating religious brainwashing seminary school, Nightcrawler has taken the mutants Loa, Pixie, DJ, and Blink with him on this mission and it turns into this whole comedy of errors that ends in tragedy when Pixie uses her abilities to rework the minds of the religious zealots that Orcus has been brainwashing. And for whatever reason, she hasn't been paying attention to the fact that one of the humans who is wearing a gas mask did not quite start buying exactly what it is that she was selling. He he unloads a mouthful of buckshot directly in Pixie's face, killing her. Now, this is all after the mutants on this mission have been flippantly talking about death and how if and when Pixie dies, it would be her first time. The fact that she's never been resurrected and she should just hurry up and get it over with. The way that they're talking about this and the way that it's even being filmed, one of the mutants, DJ, who is with it, films the entire thing so they can show it to Pixie when she's resurrected. This book, I'm going to tell you right now, this book is actually one of those that I feel people who have been very critical of what is going on with the X-Men uh, post House of X, the, the people who are kind of like the detractors, the people who are like, oh my god, this is terrible, oh my god, death is cheap now, and they just don't care anymore, and death means nothing. This book is kind of for those people, but at the same time, it's also not. Because at the end of it all, we know that no, death is not cheap. Death is but a doorway, and it is a storytelling device that can actually be used to great effect. Now that mutants have conquered death, and more importantly, it has been used as a great storytelling device in a lot of cases. We've even seen this as recently as X-Men number 18 and 19. But yes, in the eyes of mutants themselves, yes, to a lot of the younger ones, death is kind of becoming this thing that people are starting to take for granted. Things get even more weird when, of course, Kurt getting an idea from being at this mutant hate museum, he sees a statue of Magneto and decides to bring it back to Krakoa, but what he initially planned as a bit of a jape as some kind of a rib on Magneto, Magneto does something that Kurt has been unable to do. And this, I think, actually bothers Kurt more than people will probably recognize. And it's the fact that Magneto takes this jab, this statue that basically was kind of a testament to how thick-minded Magneto used to be in terms of his war against humanity 
Spidey, and more importantly, his costume choices, Magneto sees as an opportunity to teach because he uses this as a moment to remind mutantdom why mutants wasted so much time fighting amongst each other when they could have been working together and achieved so long ago what mutants have accomplished in just a year, which is a great many things. They have created medicines that have essentially cured most human ailments. They've created resurrection protocols so that mutants can never truly die. Or they can die, but they'll never truly stay dead. They've created teleportation where mutants can literally go wherever they want. Hell, there are mutants living on the moon. Magneto, a man who is, for all intents and purposes, not the most religious guy on the face of the planet, was able to move the people of Krakoa in ways Kurt wants to, but hasn't been able to figure out how to do yet. And something that Magneto is trying to help Nightcrawler understand is the fact that he is too busy trying to pull apart the strings to pull at the threads of Krakoa that he's not taking the time to enjoy it. He's too busy looking for the snakes that he's not looking for Eden. Now granted, yes, there are troubles in paradise and Krakoa is not a perfect nation. But what Magneto is basically trying to tell him is that you've spent so much time trying to find the problems that you're not actually enjoying what we have here. Things get a little more touchy when a new mutant arrival appears on the scene, and this new mutant is someone we've never met before. This is a character whose name is Lost. And there's a reason for this. You see, Kurt doesn't understand what this person is asking them. This new mutant is hurting. This is a mutant who is, for all intents and purposes, a stranger in a strange land and cannot find their way in Krakoa and Nightcrawler, simply thinking that this mutant is lost and doesn't know how to make friends, just simply directs them to the Welcome Center. What Kurt doesn't realize though is that this mutant is a mutant who has been depowered. This mutant was seeking out Kurt because everyone told this mutant that Kurt is one of the nicer of their kind and what she's asking Kurt for is not to show her around Krakoa. What she's asking for is for Kurt to be the one who kills her in the crucible. But Kurt's not giving her the opportunity to say it. She's asking him in a roundabout way, of course, but she is trying to beseech him to help her with the crucible and it doesn't occur because Kurt simply leaves because he believes he's needed elsewhere. He believes he has to seek answers somewhere else and he simply doesn't want to be bothered right now. And it's one of those rare moments for Kurt where he's kind of not being very Kurt. And of course, things become more real to Kurt when he comes to the Crucible and realizes what he's done. You see, since he will not be lost partner, Magneto is going to be. And we all know Magneto does not have a Mother Teresa's bone in his body. He is not a caregiver. He is not someone who is going to coddle or to wet nurse someone. He is going to do things his way. And I would even dare say that he's probably the last person that you want taking you through the crucible and that is even in regards to someone like Apocalypse, who seemed more caring in his killing of Arrow in X-Men number seven than Magneto seems here. Magneto is not pulling punches. He's throwing everything he has at Lost because he wants Lost to earn it. He wants her to stand on her feet, not to die on her knees. The gift of mutant power is something that, yes, Krakoa can give to any mutant, but it's not something that they're going to give willy-nilly. And this is kind of what leads back into some conversations from earlier that Nightcrawler is going to have with Dr. Nemesis, because Dr. Nemesis is a character who does eerily pop his head up in this issue. Now, granted, Dr. Nemesis, when he arrives, this issue looks rather odd because, well, for one, he's not wearing his patented hat or mask that we usually see him wearing from time to time, but he is sitting here with vegetation, both land and sea vegetation, on his head because he's doing some experimentations, and Dr. Nemesis' appearance is here. It's very interesting because he does point out some things that I feel like he's bringing the cold calculus of what it is to the forefront. The fact that he reveals it, a lot of people tend to think that it was Sage or Beast or Forge, they take it for granted as probably one of these characters who developed the teleportation flowers and the human life-saving drugs that Krakoa now has, when in fact, it was actually Dr. Nemesis. And a lot of people are probably gonna overlook something, a cold calculus of the Crucible that I think Dr. Nemesis brings up almost in passing on several occasions, but doesn't really dig too deep into until we get into some of the exposition pages that we typically get since House of X began. The fact that this has become the warrior nation that we were alluded to 
in House of X. The idea of making someone stand on their feet to fight to get their powers back is developing a warrior nation in and of itself, even if it isn't necessarily what the intent actually was. The fact that there are resurrection protocols, that they do have a long and convoluted list of people who are supposed to be resurrected and people who were depowered who need to get their powers back. But if you're willing to lay down your life in combat, which is probably a bit of pageantry that is really unnecessary, but if you're willing to show that you're willing to lay down your life for Krakoa, you will get your powers back before anyone else. And it also kind of brings up the whole idea of the fact that if you are one of these people, you have been pushed to the front of the line, that means that a warrior, someone who is more likely to want to lay down their lives for Krakoa, they are more likely to get a chance at being resurrected and by proxy, more of an opportunity to breed and create more like-minded mutants than those who are still sitting in the queue waiting to be resurrected or those who are depowered and simply too scared to go through the crucible and get their powers back. Dr. Nemesis even says so himself in regards to Nightcrawler's desire to create a mutant religion. When Nightcrawler says that what if we can't find these social rituals that will help bring people together, Dr. Nemesis says violent societal collapse. But what more likely is to happen is that the strongest individuals will simply invent rituals of their own. And that's kind of where we get into the Crucible and all of the pageantry, the things that Magneto was talking about, things we've seen Apocalypse talk about in the past. And that's exactly what's happening here. And yes, even though Lost is desperately trying to beseech Kurt to be the one, even in this moment, saying that she wanted him, it was supposed to be him, Magneto ultimately mercilessly kills Lost. But Lost does stand on her own two feet and declares her name as she dies. And, and this is actually what bothers Kurt the most is that, yeah, sure, Lost stood on her own two feet and she took the death that is required to go through the Crucible. However, that's not what bothers him. And it's not even how Magneto just took someone's life so callously and broke it down so pragmatically. Hell, it's not even the fact that Magneto says something to Kurt that I think hurt him more than anything anyone said to him a long time. The fact that nothing hurts more than a life of submission. Something he was basically making a jab again at something they spoke about earlier when talking about religion. None of that is actually what's hurting Kurt. What's hurting Kurt is how everyone is cheering at the death of one of their own. Now, that's not exactly what they're cheering. They're cheering on that this mutant who doesn't have any power, they were depowered by Wanda Maximoff on M-Day. They're getting their powers back. That's actually what they're cheering on. But Kurt fears that they're also cheering it for the wrong reasons. Now, of course, Lost is resurrected. Now, granted, we learn that their power is something that was actually causing them a great deal of pain because what they're able to do is they can create gravitational destabilization in the inner ear. That is what their power was. And because they didn't have their power, their power was actually warping and destabilizing their body. And because of the nature of her powers, granting her gravitational neutrality, her body no longer having that ability it was probably, and for all intents and purposes, making her wish she was dead because of the intense amount of pain she must have been in. But now she's causing nearly everyone, with the exception of Nightcrawler and Dr. Nemesis in the Arbor Magna, to violently throw up because she can't control her abilities. The gravitational destabilization that she causes in the inner ear is something she has no control over. It just happens. And it seems to happen to anyone within her presence, at least those who lack a very strong balance and equilibrium. But that's not the only reason Kurt was in the Arbor Magna. He was also there because Pixie is being resurrected. And of course, as we spoke before, it's being played for laughs, at least, you know, not you know, to the audience, but between the other mutants like Loa, Blink, and DJ. And something comes up that has been popping up a lot in this issue. And this is the whole thing that brings this resurrection deal to a dark turn. And it's the fact that when Pixie's resurrected, yeah, sure, she's happy to see her friends, but she's even less happy to see something that she's only heard whispers about, and that is the Patchwork Man. The Patchwork Man is a new concept that's been brought to Krakoa because in the beginning of this book, we learn that, yeah, some of the other mutants, they talk about the Patchwork Man, how the Patchwork Man is someone that people only see every once in a while. DJ even brings this up when talking to Pixie about how Pixie's probably concerned that if she dies, the Patchwork Man will get her or the Patchwork Man might be the one who kills her. Nightcrawler even seems ignorant of who the Patchwork Man is in the first place. But as the story goes on, we learn that even when Exodus is giving his 
typical teachings that we've seen kind of sprinkled throughout the X-Men comics uh, since House of X. When Exodus asks the children that he's teaching, when they're talking about Crucible, when they're talking about who is the great pretender, can you name the one who is hated most by Krakoa? The children start bringing up the patchwork man, not Wanda Maximoff, much to Exodus's chagrin. He keeps saying, no, it is the Scarlet Witch. And the kids keep going on about the patchwork man, how the patchwork man is someone who can make people do things they don't want to do. He makes you do things that could potentially hurt others. One even brings up that the patchwork man made them dream that they were cutting their mother and that when they awoke, they were digging through the drawers looking for a knife. This makes things even more ominous when we see the patchwork man that Pixie now sees until Kurt steps in the way and, and snaps her out of it. And of course, Kurt's faith is shaken once again because of the fact that when Pixie last spoke to Kurt, they were talking about cheese toasties because Pixie was musing about how she could never think of her own favorite food in her moment of death to try and think happy thoughts because her favorite food changes all the time and the last thing that she talked about was how yesterday her favorite food was sushi and today it could be a cheese toasty. Well, Kurt, trying to be thoughtful, brings Pixie a cheese toasty and while she actually thinks that that's a very nice gesture she doesn't want a cheese toasty right now because today that is not her favorite food it's sushi because the last time she was backed up was the day before she's not the person she was in the moment of death and this is something that has actually been talked about and somewhat vaguely explored we've seen this with characters like domino who oddly enough because x-force came out this week as well this is something that's actually brought up in x-force the fact that that mutants when they come back either because of the fact that they weren't backed up at the moment of their death they don't remember certain things or sometimes their minds can be edited to not remember certain things and in this particular case as charles points out she's not the person she was in the moment of her death but that doesn't mean she's not the same person now we have seen instances where people have been backed up upon moment of death we saw this in x-men number 19 when saint called out for charles xavier and charles xavier backed his mind up literally right before he died so when he was resurrected he was the same person he was in the moment of death but not everyone has that luxury granted all of this aside the real meat of the matter here is that charles is haunted by something this is something we see at the very beginning of the issue we see him looking at pictures from the past we see him looking at a picture of xandra his daughter with empress lalandra we also see him looking at a picture of a child who this being a size spurrier book we shouldn't be surprised at who he's looking at because charles Xavier wants Kurt to look into something and it is the patchwork man. Charles knows about what's going on and he's fully aware of who it is because he even posits that the person that is truly the patchwork man is an Omega level mutant and it's someone who Charles actually knows. And the reason why Charles is tasking Kurt with this is because as people often say, Kurt is the nicer of the mutants on the island and Charles knows that this person doesn't want to see him. He knows that this person has no interest whatsoever in speaking with Charles Xavier and that even if and even if they did charles would have no way of talking this person out of doing whatever it is that they're plotting to do and the last clue into who this person is is when charles admits that he's always considered himself an abysmal father despite the fact that he's a father figure to so many other mutants kurt understands people he's a people person he knows how to talk to others he knows how to guide others and charles is hoping that nightcrawler in some way shape form or fashion can help this person and maybe get them to krakow and maybe show them that there's another way. And Kurt does exactly this. He goes to the grave of Blindfold, a character who has been dead since the Matthew Rosenberg run of the Uncanny X-Men started. This was all prior to the events of House of X. Blindfold had committed suicide because she had seen something that let her know that she didn't want to exist in this world. And even if she did, she wouldn't be allowed to. She saw something and it forced her hand. And it's something that has never sat right with this particular character who is the Patchwork Man. You see the Patchwork Man and Blindfold 
Fold had shared something together. They were of, at one point in time, very close with one another. They cared for one another. They loved each other. Even though at first they started out at odds. The Patchwork Man is not crazy about the idea that precogs are not allowed on the island. This is something that the Patchwork Man knows because one of his powers is to be able to seep into the minds of other people. He knows that precogs are not allowed on the island, something that I think is the first time we've heard uttered out loud to someone who was not Magneto or Charles Xavier or Mora X. And the Patchwork Man doesn't really seem to have any interest in making nice with the mutants on Krakoa because for one, he's upset that Blindfold has not been resurrected and more importantly, the last time that he met with the X-Men, they met as enemies during X-Men Disassembled. The Patchwork Man is in fact Legion. Hence why we saw Charles Xavier musing over the picture of a baby and Gabrielle Haller. Also, real quick, I do want to point out the cleverness of the name, the Patchwork Man. This is something that Carter from the Blurred Cave actually brought to my attention. I'm not going to take credit for this one. Carter was the one that actually pointed this out to me. He posited that the Patchwork Man name makes a lot of sense when you consider the fact that Legion is a patchwork of multiple personalities, all of which who are distinct and, at the end of the day, create what Legion truly is a man whose power manifestation works through a patchwork of different personalities. It's quite clever and I gotta tip my hat. Carter nailed this one. Legion has come back and he has been teased since Reign of X was originally announced and he is now here and I don't think a lot of people expected him to show up in Way of X but honestly it's a Cy Spurrier book so Cy Spurrier has mostly been uh, popularized with X-Men for writing Legion and having Legion at the forefront of these stories and of course bringing Blindfold back into this. It all makes sense of course. Yes this is a Nightcrawler book but it is also going to be a Legion book as well and Legion seems to have no interest whatsoever in trying to mend fences or trying to work with Krakoa or even be a part of it. He seems to want to tear down the whole idea of it and likely due to the fact that he misses the woman he loves blindfold. And I think he's even made it more incredibly clear with the fact that not only is he coming with a vengeance, he's taking out Nightcrawler, seemingly dusting him Avengers Infinity War style. We knew that Legion had to pop up at some point. He was a character who was mentioned in House of X number one when the idea of Omega level mutants was revamped. So yeah, it was only a matter of time before Legion popped up. Now, Legion, personally, not one of my favorite characters. I generally find Legion and the idea of the character just completely bafflingly ridiculous, but I'm willing to be open-minded here, and I'm hoping that for the first time ever, Cy Spurrier can make me care about Legion. And hell, we've seen this happen with other characters. I've grown to like characters like Dake, and I've grown to like characters like Kid Omega. So who knows? Maybe Legion's next on the list. But anyways, I like this comic. There was a lot of good stuff here, a lot of good stuff to, to you know, chew on and, and take a look at. I like the fact that we're learning so much about, you know, the inner workings of Krakoa, even going back to what they showed us with Dr. Nemesis, showing us everything that he's actually working on and even showing us something that he has no interest in working on. The fact that he is more interested in working on things like quantum weirdness and chemical mixology and architectural botany and fertility and sexy times and time shenanigans, and psychedelic insight and logic, but has no interest in law or ethics. I don't even like the insight into why Magneto is having an easier time getting the reaction from the rest of mutantdom that Kurt can't seem to get with his talk of religion. And even though Magneto's not a religious person, he's seemingly better at doing what Kurt wants to do than Kurt is. I'm also curious to see if we ever see more of this lost character, if they're like a one and done, or maybe we'll see a little bit more of them. And maybe, who knows, we'll learn a little bit more about what's going on with Pixie and will she end up ultimately getting attacked by the patchwork man, aka a legion. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, Hulk smash that like button and make sure to share this video all over the internet and with all your friends so they'll know how you leveled up your comic book big brain in regards to the new X-Men title, Way of X. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button and let me know what you thought about Way of X number one. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.